cover um, the autumn night sky, but also some features of planetarium software. In particular, I'm going to use Stellarium. If you don't have it, it's a freeware program available from stellarium.org. Don't download it from anywhere else. Uh, they um, do frequent updates, and it, it, um, it's got a lot of interesting features. It's not so good if you're doing any serious um, scientific stuff because the catalogue it has is a specially customised catalogue, whereas if you're doing astrophotography, you want to be using one of the proper astrometric cat catalogues, like what are you using, Tony, at uh, QMU? Is it US Naval Observatory 1, UCAC 4 or something? Yeah, so um, the, um, there's a few quirks in Stellarium that means that it isn't so suitable for any kind of scientific stuff. But I recommend, um, if you don't have it, grab hold of it. It's got a slightly unusual interface. You can see the menus pop up when you drag the mouse over and down the bottom. So what I'm showing you here is, uh, if I bring up the date time, whoops, don't want that one. So that, this is this morning at 11 a.m. And um, I wanted to show you why we're doing the autumn night sky at the moment. So if we select the sun, um, I don't know, the screen isn't very good, unfortunately, so it might be a bit difficult to read. But, oh yeah, do you want to, oh, I suppose if we turn the lights off, the alarm's going to go crazy, but we'd better do it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well done. <laughs> okay, all right, hopefully that'll keep quiet for a while. So um, um, it's probably a bit difficult to read from the screen, but um, I'm looking here, the um, right ascension and declination of date is one of the things that's showing for the sun. And it's got minus zero degrees, 22 minutes, and some number of arc seconds. So if we um, change the date till tomorrow, so we'll go to the 21st, and we're still on the sun, but the right ascension is now changed to plus zero, zero forty-five, oh two forty-five. So does anyone want to guess what's happened there? Equinox. Yeah, that's right. So you can see the point where the sun is almost right on the vernal equinox point, also known as the first point of Aries. And um, basically the sun is, is always on the ecliptic. So the sun has been on the southern, oh sorry, up here, the southern side of the ecliptic and is now about to cross to the north. So that's the mark of um, astronomical autumn. And of course, the other line that it's crossing is the equator of the Earth projected onto the sky. So um, I'll just go forward a, a little bit in time again to show something else. Let's go to, um, yeah, that'll do, just after midday. So um, I don't know, can you read the constellation names off the screen okay? So um, you'll see currently the sun is in the constellation of Pisces, the fish. But I mentioned before that this crossing point is not only called the vernal equinox, it's also the first point of Aries is the other name for it. And um, you notice that Aries is actually down here. So um, you think, oh, that's a bit strange. But the reason is that um, 2,000 years ago when that name was made up, um, the equinox crossing point was indeed in the constellation Aries and over that 2,000 years it's now in Pisces it'll, um, before too long it will move into constellation Aquarius you've probably heard of the age of Aquarius um, yep It refers back to where it was 2,000 years ago, doesn't it? Oh, I think some, some of the systems do work that way. Astrology yes. uses the ecliptic system rather than the Earth-based system. Yeah. 
24 degrees apart. So that's yeah, that, yeah, they, they divide it up into even into even lots, whereas the the astronomical constellations are designed to fit around the the um, I guess you'd call them the asterisms that were traditionally representing the con constellations. So I, I think there's more than one form of astrology as well. So they don't all use the same system. But anyway, that's what's going on there. So we um, judge the um, tomorrow at 10.24, I think it is, is when the crossing actually happens. So it officially becomes astronomical autumn for us and spring in the northern hemisphere. Okay, so let's move on to the uh, night sky. Go forward to, um, uh, yeah, probably, I was going to say about 8 p.m. Well, no, it's still showing. Because if we're on, uh, still on daylight saving, I'll go to 9. So we've got a, a dark sky. And I'll get rid of the sun. So we'll just um, start off um, looking on the northwestern side of the sky. We won't go too far west because those are the constellations that are setting. And as the season goes on, they will um, disappear into solar conjunction. Um, we've still got Orion prominent in the northwestern sky. And it, it's a summer constellation, but we can still see it for quite a way into the autumn. So if you're wanting to observe anything in Orion, you're probably familiar with the Great Nebula. If I zoom in, you can see the three belt stars. Elnatak and Elnalam and Mintaka. Mintaka is quite interesting. See how close it is to the uh, to the celestial equator. Because of that, it's a really good navigation star. So if you uh, can see Mintaka rising or setting, you get a really good bearing on due east or due west. Um, it's upside down for us. The the three stars will look like stars to the unaided eye pointing upwards from the belt are actually meant to be Orion's sword hanging downwards from his belt. And the, the central one, if you look at it, it looks a bit fuzzy. And even binoculars, you can see that it's a nebulous object. And of course, we have the great nebula of Orion, M42. Also in this area, and you can't see it um, with the unaided eye really, but um, with um, photography is the famous Horsehead Nebula and the Flame Nebula near Elnatak. Um, typically, if you photograph that area, you want to make sure Elnatak isn't in view because it will tend to overexpose really horribly if you're wanting to bring out the fainter nebula. So, um, some of the things you can learn from these programs, for example, if I Select Betelgeuse, or Betelgeuse as some people say. You can see there's quite a lot of information and in Stellarium is, oh, sorry, it might be Alistair ringing back. Sorry, I better answer, he's the guy that sorted things out for us. Hi Alistair. Yeah, the people hire us and refuse to allow us access. Oh, okay, we're in and we've, we've basically tripped the alarm. <laughs> Sorry about that. That was Alistair. He says they refuse to do anything about it, but if they want to complain, well, it's, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, you, notice that the, you notice the text comes up with a colour. So um, if I um, select um, a, a bluish star, the text comes up with a whitish-blue text, so that's a bit of a cutesy thing in Stellarium. So you can tell what kind of star it is, a red giant or a main sequence star, that kind of thing. It actually alters the colour of the text. Um, but it gives you some useful information. We can see here, uh, it tells you obviously the constellation of the star, but something else that's interesting is a thing called the proper motion. You possibly can't read the number, but it's 29.77 milli arc seconds per year uh, towards 67.7 degrees. So the way they work this is imagine there's a, a compass on the star 
and it's got a compass bearing from 0 to 360. So um, north for us will be down, so that's 0. So basically what that's telling you is that relative to the sun, Betelgeuse is moving that way roughly, about 60, yeah, about like that, 60 odd degrees. So that number of arc seconds per year is very low, so you would have to take a long time to really notice anything beyond a human lifetime. In fact, the first person who really um, noticed that the stars weren't actually in fixed positions but were moving relative to each other was Sir Edmund Haley. And he actually um, looked at some of the stars in the Hipparchus um, catalogue that were done in ancient Greece. And Hipparchus was an excellent observational astronomer, and so his data was quite trustworthy. And um, so Haley was able to work out that there were some stars that had, were actually moving quite noticeably over that um, period of 2,000 years. So that, that's what we call proper motion. You don't cast her in pollocks. Uh, you can see there. Um, you may not be able to make out the other stars so easily, but you'll definitely see those two even from suburban Auckland quite easily. And we'll, we'll, go, we'll just um, make our way along the ecliptic for the moment. So we come next to the constellation of Cancer the Crab. And it's, when you look at it, it's fairly nondescript. There's only quite faint stars. Um, I think this possibly the brightest one is only fourth magnitude. So you'd look at it and think, oh, it's quite an uninteresting area of sky. But um, obviously, if you're at a dark site, you can see those stars. Um, but there's a nice um, little star cluster in here called the Beehive Cluster. Messier 44, and it um, shows up quite well in binoculars or a small telescope. If you've got a really a big, long focal length scope, it isn't so good because it's actually hard to get the entire cluster into the field of view. So if I um, zoom in, you can see Stellarium sort of tries to give a roughly what it looks like in, in a uh, probably binoculars or small telescope. Little um, red circles in the background, does anyone know what those are? Little red ovals? Yeah, so that, that's the symbol that this program uses for galaxies. And it's pretty standard to use an oval um, like that, not the colour but the shape of, um, to indicate a galaxy. So if you see a um, star chart or other programs will have a similar, a similar scheme for indicating various deep sky objects. So we'll zoom out of Cancer and then we come along to the next um, ecliptic constellation which is the um, constellation of Leo the Lion. Uh, this one um, kind of does, when you see it the other way up, it does kind of resemble, uh, you could think that, oh yeah, it sort of a, resembles a lion sort of crouching down with his paws tucked up perhaps, if you have a bit of imagination. So... Um, um, there's some reasonably bright stars in there, particularly Regulus. And um, you notice that Regulus is quite close to the ecliptic. Um, it's considered to be one of the so-called royal stars of um, Persian astrology. Um, deep sky objects in here. Uh, where do we find them? We've got some galaxies in here, but you need, definitely need a telescope to see them. Let's see if it'll tell us. Yep. So um, we'll have to zoom right in, and you see there's a group of galaxies here called the Leo Triplet, and um, one of them's even um, called the Hamburger Galaxy because of a having a sort of a dark lane across it, as you see in the image there. So maybe you could think that's um, uh, um, the meat patty and a hamburger between two slices of bread. You can, you quite often see people, um, if you haven't got too um, narrow a field, you can get all three galaxies within one field and 
you see a few um, images of that on the internet of the three, the three. And as I'm zooming in there, you see there's a lot of other galaxies starting to pop up. And in fact, this um, area of the sky of um, Leo going through to Virgo is very rich in galaxies. So the autumn is really the season, season of galaxies, if you like, if you're into observing galaxies. Zoom out a bit so we can see where we are. And then um, we will um, go to the last um, constellation or zodiacal constellation we're going to talk about is Virgo. And I'll, I'll move the time on a little bit so we can get the whole thing into the view. So obviously as the uh, each month um, the stars are rising two hours earlier. So the month later, if you, what you were seeing at um, midnight now, in a month's time, that's what you'll see at 10 p.m. So um, obviously if you multiply 12 by 2, 24, you're back to where you started from. So in actual, if you want to be precise about it, the stars arrive, I think it's 3 minutes and 56 seconds earlier every night. So... Um, so, uh, the really, um, there's a really prominent star in this part of the sky is Spica, which is Alpha Virgo. And um, if we zoom in here, we should see there's heaps and heaps of galaxies, depending on how far we zoom in. So, if you're into galaxy hunting, um, Leo and Virgo are the places to go. But um, what I want to do is, we won't move off this um, part of the sky yet. I'm going to go um, a bit higher up, uh, above to the south of the uh, ecliptic. And we've got, I'll go, we've got the constellation Corvus the Crow. So um, this one um, is... Um, Hasn't got um, any uh, interesting sort of star clusters or globulars, but one thing it is interesting for is we have um, the Sombrero galaxy. So you can easily see this sort of um, lopsided um, quadrilateral, I guess you'd call it, of um, Corvus. And then you can see this um, Eta Corvus star because it's, it's, um, you can't confuse it for the other corners because this is a, is a little bit brighter, this eta. If you follow this down and you can, um, if I zoom in hopefully I'll be able to explain this, you sort of drift your way down these stars and you'll see these in binoculars, there's a little sort of arrowhead slightly flattened and then within a binocular field you should be able to see those three stars and these three which are a bit fainter but they act as a pointer to find the Sombrero galaxy. Um, yeah, and you'll probably struggle to see the galaxy in binoculars, but um, in your finder or binoculars, you'll see these stars. So you can position your finder on your telescope visually if you haven't got go to. Um, it's quite an easy way to find the Sombrero galaxy. Um, you won't see anything spectacular on a small scope, just a even from a dark area, it's just a, a smudge really, uh, which is the way most galaxies appear to the um, visually, unfortunately. And then we have the constellation of Crater, the Carp, as we're coming back up this way. So um, above Crater, you can see that one is, sort of looks like a cup that's been somebody's smash with a hammer or something. <laughs> The base of it's been a bit bent. And then um, above um, Crater, we have the constellation Hydra, which is one of the two really long constellations in the sky, along with Eridana. So this is the uh, Hydra, the water snake. And um, it actually goes a long way, all the way down to, um, to Libra, down this end. And at the other end, it's... Um, right up to the edge of um, Canis Minor and on also borders onto Cancer as well. So um, there's a really interesting deep sky object in here, 
to zoom in. And this you should be able to see in a relatively small telescope, but bigger aperture is better. Is a um, planetary nebula. Yeah, hopefully um, Solarium will have a, an image of this. If we zoom in. Yeah. So um, it, this is one of the few nebula that you can see colour in with, um, without a camera. You can see, but you need, need a fairly big aperture scope. It's definitely obvious in the Zeiss telescope at the observatory with a half metre mirror. But if you've got a large Dobsonian, you'll be able to, should be able to tell that it's got a, a bluish green sort of colour. And um, yeah, so do um, have a look uh, for that if you've got a, 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 with a smaller telescope, you should be able to still see it because it's a relatively bright object. Um, surface brightness of magnitude between six and seven. But yeah, bigger aperture is better. The interesting thing about these, the reason they're called planetary nebula was, I think it was um, William Herschel who named these objects. He, his, he had an 18 inch and a, I think a 40 inch reflector, so he could see these things quite easily when he was trying to catalogue the entire sky. He saw these sort of round, really um, smudgy objects. And because they are similar in size to planets as you see them, if, if Jupiter was in here at this sort of zoom level, it would be a similar size. So um, he um, realised they obviously weren't planets because they were stellar in nature, they weren't moving or anything. But he, um, because of the similarity in size and being round, he called them planetary nebula as opposed to other kinds of nebula. What they actually are is the remnant of a star like the sun that's um, basically run out of its um, fuel, goes through hydrogen helium burning phase and then finally runs out of nuclear fuel and the last gas it blows off the outer atmosphere and forms this nebula and you end up with a white dwarf remaining in the centre of the nebula and the hot white dwarf is very hot so that's what causes the nebula to glow like that. So um, yeah, just um, this, if you can see the, um, follow the line of Hydra, you can see that if you can see these stars that make a sort of a zigzag shape like that, um, you can um, sort of figure out that if you can find this star and then you just go a little bit off, off course, away from the, or the way the, the, the zig is pointing in the zigzag, and um, you should be able to hopefully find it. Obviously all of these things, if you've got a go-to scope, once you're aligned, it's pretty trivial to, to do that. The, um, there is a Greek legend behind this. Um, I think it involved a, a crow that was asked by um, Apollo to go, the Greek god Apollo, to go and fetch water. So the, um, the crow got distracted uh, on his mission and didn't get the water and um, so um, when he returned he came back with the cup and no water and Apollo punished him by casting him into the sky. The reason the snake is there is that Corvus tried to make an excuse that he couldn't get the water because the water snake was um, stopping him from getting the water. So Apollo threw the water snake into the sky as well. I think that's how the story goes. Okay, I'm going to go um, a little bit further on. It's not uh, when you get into Libra, we we'll probably consider that to be getting towards the end of the autumn sky and towards winter. But um, I just wanted to show something here, and it's a bit more information you can get out of this program. So um, you see just coming up over the horizon is the star Arcturus and um, because it's fairly low and it's a very bright star people often will, will notice it especially if there's a lot of scintillation low down and it flashes different colours but um, what I was going to show you is if I select the star remember I talked about proper motion before and there was 
The previous star we looked at had a proper motion of something like 20 milliarc seconds per year. If we look at this one, the proper motion is 2,200 milliarc seconds per year, which is quite a lot. That's um, two arc seconds every year. So over um, a few hundred years, you definitely notice even visually a difference in the position of Arcturus. Uh, if we see here, it gives its distance as um, uh, 36 light years. And so it's actually not one of the real close stars. It's not, it's sort of part of the general neighbourhood, I guess. But um, if you compare the proper motion of Alpha Centauri, Alpha Centauri's proper motion is something like 3,000 milliarc seconds per year. So you'd think, well, um, this star's a lot further away, maybe eight times as far away, but its proper motion is nearly as great. And the reason is, is because Arcturus is moving quite fast um, relative to the stars in the, in the Milky Way that are in the disk like the Sun that are bobbling along fairly sedately. Arcturus is part of a star stream that's actually diving through the disk. So it's, um, it comes from... The, the halo outside the disk and just happens to be passing through the disk relatively close by to us. So um, it's a star of mass just a little bit greater than the Sun. I think it's estimated 1.2 solar masses, but it's uh, much older than the Sun and, and starting to get near to the end of its life. It's starting to approach the red giant phase. All, all main sequence stars get brighter as they, as they go along as well, so that's why it's a lot brighter than the sun. Um, that's probably enough for the um, northern sky. So let's have a look around to the south. We'll just um, drag it around. And zoom in. Actually, we'll go go over to the, um, uh, which side shall I start on? I'll start on the eastern side. These are the things coming up. So um, we still um, have um, some, uh, well, we've got a winter constellation sneaking, it just sneaking in here. It's because I'd forgotten I'd gone f forward quite a bit in time. So let's go back. Okay, that's a bit better. So we come into um, this time of year, we've got these are the constellations that are rising. Because on this side of the sky we're looking towards the pole, you can see the, the uh, motion of the, all the stars and constellations is quite curved. Remember all the, uh, the, the sky to us appears to be travelling in a circle around the poles. So in this one we're looking towards the South Celestial Pole which is around here. Well, that was lucky I hit right onto Polaris or Stratus without actually seeing it. Anyway, um, still um, on this side we've got the constellation of, um, I won't talk about Lupus because that's um, probably a little bit low yet. But that, that, as the season goes on that will be getting higher. It's, uh, Lupus is the constellation of the wolf. And um, we will just go straight into Centaurus I think. So I'll zoom in just a wee bit. So you'll recognise here the um, star officially now called Rigel Centaurus. The IAU gave it that as an official name. Not sure why, but apparently it was a star a name that navigators used a lot. Anyway, that's um, this, that system, also known as Alpha Centauri, is the closest neighbour to our... Um, solar system, it's actually a, a triple, there's two stars close together and there's a third star which is quite a distance away, Proxima Centauri, but believed to be in a really long orbit around the other two stars. Proxima is a bit of an unusual one because it's only about ninth magnitude but it's been given a, a name and it's only because it's the nearest star to us that it has a proper, an official proper name. I'm just going to centre on there and um, zoom right in. Oh, I hadn't actually centred properly. 
what's going on here it's not letting me so oh yeah it has selected it so i'll try centering it again that's better now if we zoom in a lot <laughs> you can see it's just starting to um split the the two stars but if you um, look at it in a telescope you should be able to split them they're only if um, they're quite close together but um a, on a good night of good seeing, even a small telescope will split them. Um, one of the stars is slightly uh, more massive than the sun, and the other one's slightly less massive. Um, but they're very similar to the sun. The orbital period of the two stars orbiting each other is around 80 years. So the separation changes over time. So um, it sometimes, depending on where they are relatively in their orbit, they can be a bit harder to split than at other times. Now, if we follow um, the uh, line to the other pointer, which is called Hadar or Beta Centauri, we can um, take a turn along this um, line here. It's actually pretty easy to see this if you go along the line and then head off towards that, the left at the moment when you're um, looking south you will see there's another star keep going along that line about the same and uh, distance um, you'll see the stars in a dark uh, not a star sorry in a, from a dark sight you'll actually be able to see this with the unaided eye and it looks like a slightly fuzzy star you won't see it from the city but it's the um, globular cluster known as Omega Centauri. So it's the richest globular, although some say that it isn't a globular, that it's actually the, the uh, remnant of a core of a uh, dwarf galaxy that's basically had all of its other material stripped off by the Milky Way. But if we centre it and zoom in, we'll see that it's um, just an absolute riot of stars. There's, there's a, more than a million stars in this cluster. It's basically when you look at it, it looks like, um, like just a, a, a blob of grains of sand in the sky. There's so many stars there. Even in a small scope, you may not be able to resolve those stars, but you'll definitely be able to easily see it. If we go on to galaxies again, if we um, carry on about, um, say, half as far and go down a bit, you can see this um, Centaurus A as another hamburger galaxy. But this one is, um, the Centaurus A indicates that it's a radio galaxy, and the A means it's basically, I think it was the first um, non-solar system radio source discovered and it was actually discovered in New Zealand interestingly they um, used the ocean as a reflector with receivers up on top of the hill at Piha and they um, this was just after the second world war and the people working there detected this um, radio signals coming from space and eventually they worked out that it was coming from this galaxy Centaurus A um, from Piha, they couldn't work it out that accurately, but they knew that it was something in this part of the sky. It was in Centaurus, and it was radio source A in, in that constellation. Eventually, it was pinned down to this galaxy. If we zoom in, you probably recognise, many of you may have seen images of this. There's one um, done by a club member, um, Rolf Olsen, who lives out at Titarangi. Um, he did, um, was it something like a hundred hours? Can you, anyone remember? Yeah, it was something like that. It was something like a hundred hours of exposures um, stacked together to bring out um, details that had only been seen in professional scopes before. Um, he picked up all, uh, lots of globular clusters that this galaxy has. I mentioned globulars before. They actually um, also are in the in the, um, I guess you'd call it the um, halo of the Milky Way, and so they orbit independently to the disk. So sometimes they're passing through the disk, and they're above the disk or below the disk, but almost all of them from our point of view 
uh, towards the galactic core. There are very few that are further out from where the sun is. So when you look towards Orion, which is the opposite side of the galaxy to where the galactic core is, there are very few globular clusters on that side of the sky. So um, that's the reason for that. Of course, when we um, come up, we have, um, everyone should know, this constellation of Crux, the Southern Cross. There's um, some interesting things to see here. I mentioned that um, Alpha Centauri is a double star that you can split. The brightest star in the cross, A Crux. I don't know, I don't know why they gave it that name either. <laughs> it's um, Alpha Crucis is the Bayer type name for it, but it has an official name of A Crux. Uh oh, might have been me. <laughs> I think I stepped backwards slightly. Oh, was somebody going out? Okay. So if we um, we can do the same thing on this one. Zoom in, and yeah, um, that star there isn't the double I was talking about. You can see this one is a slightly fainter star in binoculars. So you'll split those two quite easily in binoculars. But I don't know if it'll yeah. Uh, Stellarium doesn't render it all that well, it starts to get a bit strange looking. But um, there is actually a, a, another binary there that you can split with a, a good aperture telescope. Uh, this um, star here, Mimosa, is Beta Crucis. Now we, um, you can use this as a marker to find uh, what's known as the Jewel box cluster or, or Kappa Crucis. I'll just um, recenter here. And you can see the, um, uh, you know, I'll actually put it on that. This is um, um, just a, a quick thing on names of these objects, like um, as it mentions here, it calls it Herschel's Jewel Box. That was um, Name, that name was made up by John Herschel, William Herschel's son. Um, basically, he went to Cape Town to do the same job his father had done in the Northern Hemisphere, basically trying to catalogue all the deep sky objects, um, which he did from Cape Town. So he, he um, catalogued this cluster, thought it looked like a collection of jewels, so he called it the Jewel Box Cluster. So that's the origin of the name. It's also called Kappa Crucis because navigators had previously um, catalogued it as a star because you can actually see, see it with the naked eye. Uh, it looks like a slightly fuzzy looking star. You can't, you can't actually tell that it's a star cluster without a telescope or binoculars will too. It's a quite a pretty cluster to look at. Um, yeah, it doesn't look too much dissimilar to that when you look at it in a in a telescope. The other thing I was going to show about Mimosa, if we go back here, um, you notice that it has, it's showing up quite blue and um, the way they do these colours is what's known as a colour index where they take a, um, a blue filter in this case which is B and a visual filter, they measure the magnitude in those two filters and the difference between them is the colour index. So this star has, a, has a, one of the highest blue indexes in the sky. So that tells you the star is, or I mean when I say in the sky, of those stars that you can see with the naked eye, it's, it's one of the bluest. And it's in fact towards the high end of any of the blue stars. So that tells you that it's got a really hot surface so I'll just center it because I want to zoom in on this. And this um, here, you can see this star here. I think it doesn't know what this is, which is one of the annoying things about Stellarium when you get into the fainter stars. It doesn't have as much information about them. Probably find other applications like um, Sky Safari on mobile phone might be better for this or Can't Do Seal, which is another open source PC program. So um, 
it's showing the star is really red, and it's quite interesting because this is this is one of the reddest stars known as the carbon star called Dy Crucis. It's a variable, so the colour noticeably changes when you're observing it just visually. Um, sometimes it almost looks like a, um, a deep sort of coppery looking colour. And um, the interesting thing about it, it's um, really close in the sky to the um, one of the hottest and bluest stars in the sky. Um, they have no physical association though, it's just a pure chance line of sight thing. Oh, we should talk about this one since we talked about the um, the um, ghost of Jupiter and Hydra. Um, we have here another um, planetary nebula. Most of them are pretty small and dim unless you've got a large aperture and a dark observing sky. So I, um, this one, I can definitely see this in an 8-inch telescope that it is blue or bluey green colour called the blue planetary. So the reason you can see a bit of colour in some of these is because they're small and bright, they have a relatively high surface brightness that is enough to actually, um, especially the, the um, green receptors in your eye are quite sensitive. The other, the red and blue sensors, um, cells, um, cone cells in your eyes aren't, aren't as sensitive. So you, you're, um, if you have a go and see if you can see the colour in this one, it's called the blue planetary. Now this one's quite easy to find as well. You go along the short arm of the cross about the same distance and then you see this pattern of four stars here. They're quite obvious in telescope finder or binoculars. So as soon as you find that pattern of stars, um, go to the one that's sort of closer to the line between these two to either side and then about a third of the way along to this one is, is how you find it. So that's quite cool to be able to see some, some actually see some colour other than a bit of colour in stars. You don't normally get that in nebulas. Right next to the Southern Cross is um, everybody's unfavourite constellation, I guess, was well, the constellation Musk of the Fly. But it's actually um, it's quite a small constellation like the Southern Cross, um, a little bit bigger. You can see that the Southern Cross is actually the smallest constellation. If you see that red line there, Musca is a little bit bigger, but still quite small. If we zoom in, there's actually couple of, um, if it will show me, uh, where are we going? Oh, is it not going to show me? Mm, that's disappointing. Oh, hang on. Oh, it's because I've Yeah, no, I'm not sure what's going on there. It doesn't seem to be rendering them. There's a couple of globular clusters that I thought it should show up at that sort of zoom in level. But I, ah, no, okay, that's interesting. Planetary nebula there, but um, I wouldn't bother with this one too much when it's got a name like PK302. It's going to be um, really faint and is really going to be just a photographic object. Oh, hang on. Uh, I think I found one of the ones I was talking about. Yeah. So, uh, it probably was showing that before and I wasn't seeing it. Sorry about that. This, um, there's a nice globular cluster here. So if you can find this sort of um, uh, shape, not the shape of the constellation, which I think was confusing me, but you can see this shape here, another sort of... Um, quadrilateral that's slightly um, lopsided and just off to the side if you're within a finder field of this um, star here you'll be able to see this um, should be able to see this globular cluster reasonably bright one and you notice that it's got a name of C108 NGC 4372 and Malot 112 so they're different catalogues it appears on so 
The NGC catalogue is an all-sky satellite uh, catalogue of deep sky objects, which was based on the Herschel's maps, star maps. Um, it was added to by Dreyer and some other people, and they came up with the new, what's called the new general catalogue. It's only 120 years old or something, so <laughs> not that new anymore. And then the, the, C, the C one stands for Caldwell, and that um, is a catalogue invented by Patrick Moore. You probably heard he ran the BBC Sky at Night show um, since the 1950s until he passed away about 10 years ago. So, um, yeah, he, Caldwell was his mother's name, I think. So the reason he made up this catalogue was because you probably heard of the Messier catalogue that Charles Messier had of a lot of deep sky objects that were seen visually in the Northern Hemisphere. But he missed quite a few things and definitely didn't have any real Southern Hemisphere objects like this one because observing from Paris you can't see these things. So um, Patrick Moore thought there ought to be a similar catalogue that covers the Southern, southern Hemisphere plus the objects that Messier missed or Messier and his colleagues. So that's the Caldwell catalogue. Um, I won't spend too much time here because I'm aware we've gone over time with the alarm craziness. Um, you can see right here in Dorado is the um, large Magellanic cloud. You can see that from a dark sky site. Small Magellanic cl cloud. Um, I'll definitely mention the small cloud because there's some um, some good uh, deep sky objects, especially if you've got a large aperture scope. But even a small aperture scope will f show this object here, 47 Tacane, which is the second brightest globular cluster in the sky. Definitely well worth a look at. And um, also near the small Magellanic cloud is another globular. Uh, let's see if I can spot it here. Oh, it's, it's called 75 Tucane there, and Caldwell 104 NGC 362. So there's actually two uh, quite decent globulars to observe that are, are right next to the small Magellanic cloud. Uh, especially this one is easy to find because it's really bright. So even sweeping through this area on binoculars, you should be able to find it quite easily. Um, just back to... Um, the large cloud again, one thing we should mention here is the um, NGC 2070, it's known as the Tarantula Nebula. If you can see the large cloud, you'll see off to one side of it, there's a sort of a, a glowing patch that's sort of off the main part of the large cloud. That's the, um, the area where the Tarantula Nebula is. It's the, the most active star forming region in the local cluster of galaxies actually so I don't know if you've ever seen it in a telescope but it sort of looks spidery filaments and um, that's where it gets the name from but um, it's amazing you can actually see it because it's um, distance is something like 170,000 light years You're familiar with the great nebula in Orion is only 1500 light years away so it's a hundred times as far, but it's um, probably just as impressive to look at as the as Messier 42. I think somebody pointed out that if, if it was at the same distance as the Orion Nebula M42, this thing would cover about a third of the uh, sky. So it's a pretty amazing object. There's some really intense um, star formation going on in there, super massive stars. I think... Um, many stars of over a hundred solar masses uh, so stars that are uh, emitting huge amounts of ultraviolet radiation that's causing all this glow so I think I'll um, uh, um, if you don't know it just before we finish the sky tour part of it um, you, if you're not sure how to orient yourself you can use a trick to find south find the southern cross and um, run a line down the long arm of the cross 
and then go to the pointers and run a line sort of bisecting the pointers and roughly where the, the um, two lines meet is the South Celestial Pole. Unfortunately, we don't have a, a bright pole star. We have Polaris Australis, which is you'd have to have extremely good eyesight to see even from a rural site. It's only just a bit brighter than sixth magnitude, which is close to the limit of what you can see with the unaided eye. Um, I was just going to um, say one other thing about things that you can do with this program. Um, play around with it, but one really useful thing is comets. Um, you hear about a new comet that's um, being discovered and they, you hear reports, oh, it's going to be visible or whatever, and you want to know um, where the heck is it. So you've got this um, plugins here, and the one you're looking for is the Solar System Editor plugin. When you download it, um, it may not know about the comet that people are talking about in, in the news or whatever. So what you do is you go into the Solar System plugin, click the configure button, and then you have to go Solar System, and you see it's got a list of um, objects. So what you do is you click this Import Orbital Elements, and you can, um, if you know of a website that um, has got the orbital elements in the right format, you can do that and they will publish those. But there's a couple of, um, or more than a couple, a number of that are um, that it already knows about. And for new comets, the, um, it's got minor planets, observable um, minor planets, numbered planets. So this is for asteroids as well. But we can also... Um, um, if we change the selection to comets, we can go select bookmark. We can um, go to the minor planet centers list of observable comets. Get orbital elements. It won't work at the moment because I haven't got an internet connection. But basically, you click that, and it'll download them, and it'll ask you, do you want to update or add or update or overwrite your existing comet information? So any new comets that pop up, that's how you get them into Stellarium. And then once the program knows about the comet, you can use this. I'm going to quickly go back in time to... Um, whoops, I went, went the wrong way, sorry. And we'll um, bring up astronomical calculations window. Now we want to um, select ephemeris and in fact, oh actually I'd already done one so um, I didn't need to go back in time but um, we'll use this one which is a comet that is supposed to be um, visible around next October so it's still a long way out in the solar system between Saturn and Jupiter but it's predicted to be um, reasonable for um, next year. So if we actually, I'll, I'll do that because it's a bit silly where we are. Um, just get that out for a moment. Back to the date and time, we'll go to 24. That'll do, September. And then we bring this back. We can get it to calculate the positions of the comet, so we go from, we'll go right through to next year, let's say August, and we'll go to October, oh, so we'll make it November, that'll do, and then we can say, um, show the line with markers, we can plot the dates, and we can say the time step. Well, let's make it one. Um, let's make it um, every five solar days. Calculate. So um, that's basically going to um, show you the um, the position of the uh, of the comet over time. Now, hopefully, if I go around to where it actually is, yeah, it's plotted it for us. So it's really worth exploring the features of these programs. You can um, 
yeah, pick a, if, you're, if you're looking for a comma and it doesn't have it, go into the solar system editor, tell it to download the latest data from the Minor Planet Center. And there's some other options as, as well if the Minor Planet Center hadn't updated theirs yet. So um, I guess we'd better leave it at that. Um, sorry about the big problems here. We're going to have to try and chat to these people tomorrow to make sure that it's sorted out for the rest of the time here. Um, are there any questions before we finish? Is there a problem with how you start Yeah, um, they, are, they are quite close, but um, it's not like, um, well, some of, there will be binary stars and, and triplets, uh, triples on those globulars, but generally they would be less than a light year apart quite often. So much closer together than stars in the Milky Way, uh, just general stars in the Milky Way. Yeah. I'll have to wait till we... Any other questions? Anything well, online? Oh, sorry, that, there's one here. Well, well about the stars that are going to die soon. So they are probably already dead because there are millions of light years away. So oh, you mean uh, in distant galaxies? Yeah, well, the, the nearest galaxies are the two Magellanic clouds, and uh, the large cloud is around 170,000 light years away. So if anyone was alive when that um, light left there, um, then they're unlikely to be alive today unless they lived more than 170,000 years. And th those are the near, uh, the small cloud is a bit further away, about two hundred thousand light years. After that is the Andromeda galaxy. That's um, two million. Well, actually, that's not one hundred percent true because there's actually supposedly a dwarf galaxy actually passing through the Milky Way itself at the moment, but it's on the far side of the galaxy, so we can't easily see it. I think it's called the Sagittarius dwarf. So. Um, that, that will be in the process of merging with the Milky Way, which is what um, happens quite often with these smaller galaxies that are orbiting larger galaxies. I think you were asking, like, would all the stars we can see right now, you know, they're far away? Oh, still be there. Yeah, yeah, m most of them, because stars last, um, star like the Sun will last for 10 or 11 billion years. So it would only be extremely distant galaxies where the stars you're seeing would be not there anymore, except for the really bright stars. The brighter the stars are intrinsically, the shorter their life. Like a star like Rigel, which is really hot and bright, won't last anywhere near as long as the sun. The stars that are really massive, because they are massive, they have a lot higher pressure in their cores, so they burn up their um, fuel, nuclear fuel, a lot faster because the reactions just go faster with the higher pressure and temperature in their cores. Beetlejuice. That's yeah. right, yeah, that, that star is probably going to go supernova, probably not in our lifetimes, but in star terms in relatively short time. Okay, I guess we'll leave it at there, and um, hopefully we can get this um, admin for this place properly sorted. Thank you both.